and gentlemen, and dear colleagues and friends, uh, it's my great pleasure and also great honor for me to introduce um, our colleague and dear friend, uh, Professor Donald Stone. Um, Professor Stone is Professor Emeritus at the Graduate Center, City University of New York. And currently, he is research professor teaching in the English department at Peking University. Uh, he got his PhD from Harvard University. Uh, his major publications include Novelists in the Changing World and The Romantic Impulse in Victorian Fiction. Both books were published by Harvard University Press. And uh, another major work is a critical study of Matthew Arnold entitled Communications with the Future, Matthew Arnold in Dialogue. Uh, these three books were uh, available at the, uh, in our main library. Uh, all, um, but my introduction today will not focus on Professor Stone's academic achievement. Uh, instead, I want to concentrate on the contributions he has made to the English department and also to the Peking University. Um, Donald is an old friend of ours. Uh, everyone in our department uh, loves him. And he paid his first visit to Beijing back in the 1980s. And at, at that time, he started to make friends with uh, some of the leading scholars of English literature, uh, including some of our faculty members. Uh, starting from 2006, he came to our campus regularly. Uh, he came to our campus every fall semester and taught two courses. And for this semester, uh, Donald was teaching an undergraduate course on English novel and also a graduate seminar uh, on Victorian literature. Uh, both courses drew a large number of students and are immensely popular. In addition to regular teaching, Donald uh, devoted his spare time to organize reading groups for the graduate students. Uh, for example, last year, uh, he led a reading group and tried to help graduate students read uh, Victorian poetry. Right? And for this semester, uh, Donald asked the graduate students to watch a very popular uh, TV drama uh, dramatic TV series called Man Man in Chinese, uh, and, and trying to introduce uh, some of the major historical events uh, that happened in the, back in the 1960s in America. Uh, but Donald is so dedicated to teaching, both in class and after class, uh, and he is so nice and helpful to uh, students uh, in our department that they now they start calling him uh, Grandpa Stone. Uh, <laughs> Stone yeah, yeah. Uh, just as they call Professor Randall, Tom Randall, another dear friend of ours, Grandpa Randall. <laughs> uh, last June, uh, Donald was granted a very prestigious award by the Beijing municipal government in recognition of his uh, contribution to higher education in China. And I remember uh, at a very small, con uh, a very small banquet we held uh, in honor of Don Donald, he said, uh, this award is not only for me, it is for everyone in the English department. So all of us who were present on that occasion were deeply touched by his kind words and also by his uh, commitment to this department. Uh, <clears throat> Donald is a passionate lover of art, and he told me he started to collect paintings uh, when he was 12 years old. Uh, when he started to teach on this campus regularly, he decided to donate part of his uh, very precious collections to the Secular Museum of Art and uh, Archaeology at Bay Beida. And if I remember correctly, uh, Donald has so far donated more than 200 items uh, to the Cyclone Museum uh, in order to make some of the uh, Western masterpieces more accessible to the students both at Beida and also in China. Uh, so I, I would really like to say to Donald that we are really grateful to you for everything you have done 
both to this department and also to uh, Peking University. Well, uh, I can talk about Donald for hours uh, if, if, if no one uh, stops me. But, but I feel I have to stop here to give more time uh, to Donald to introduce some of the uh, great Western landscape painters uh, from Bruegel and Rembrandt to Bonnard and Chabelle. So ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Professor Donald Stone to give the talk on landscape and cityscape. Donald. Uh, 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 last week I was in Macau in Hong Kong giving talks and managed to lose my voice in both of those cities. So I, I have just a kind of a, a shall we say, a, 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 a remains of a voice uh, right now. And after, after your very, very dear words, I'm, I'm so choked up that I'm not sure I could, I could, I could eat, speak even if my voice were not. Um, if, if my voice were, were, were clear. Uh, I, I wanted to begin with a, a poem that I hope most of you know uh, by Wordsworth called The World is Too Much With Us. Uh, one, one, one of the great expressions in, in Western literature of the importance of nature. Perhaps the greatest single concentrated poem. He, he speaks of, of living at a time of getting and spending where people seem to think that the only thing to live for is buying things and having things. And uh, he feels that people have lost touch with nature as a result, with the things that matter, but specifically with the landscapes, with the natural world. He says that the world is too much with us. Late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Little we see in nature that is ours. We have given our hearts away, a sordid boon. The sea that bears her bosom to the moon, the winds that will be howling at all hours, and are upgathered now like sleeping flowers. For this, for everything, we are out of tune. It moves us not. Great God, I'd rather be a pagan suckled in a creed outworn, so might I, standing on this pleasant lea, have glimpses that would make me less forlorn have sight of Proteus rising from the sea, or hear old Triton blow his wreathed horn. Um, we, we were having lunch the other day, uh, uh, Fang Fang and I, and I was mentioning uh, a couple of weeks ago, I happened to be in the east part of the city, and I noticed that there was a subway stop right at the new CCTV tower the new CCTV building. I, I had seen it from a distance. I mean, I had seen it going up, but I, I had never seen it completed, and I had never actually had a chance to walk around it. And I thought, well, you know, it looked hideous while it was going up, and it looked hideous from a distance, but I thought, I, I will give it, you know, an hour of time to walk around it and to try to see if, if this building were really perhaps... Perhaps there was some artistic, natural, human merit to, to, this, to, to this huge building. And, and, and I, I must admit that, that I was absolutely horrified by this expression, if you want to call it, of the modern spirit. Uh, the New York Times architect, uh, architectural writer had just written a few months ago that it was the single most important architectural building of the 21st century. So I thought, well, what, what does that say of the 21st century? <laughs> you, you stand under the building, and it looks like some great monster from another planet. There's absolutely nothing in the architecture that makes any contact with human beings at all. It's a great big oppressive structure designed to show how insignificant human beings are and how what should we say, how, how grandiose are the ideas of, of, of architects, uh, television companies, and perhaps uh, uh, city government. Uh, it, it, it's, it's, the very, it's the very sort of thing that if, if Wordsworth had, had seen, I'm, I'm sure he would have written several sonnets deploring. <laughs> uh, when, when I was looking at the, at the, the landscapes, especially the Chinese landscapes that we'll be looking at, this is, this is, of course, 
one of the very great masterpieces of Chinese painting, Dwelling in the Fushan Mountains by Huang Gong Wang. Uh, just this past summer, this is an article also from the Times, uh, the Taiwan Museum, which owns most of the painting, had a special exhibition in which the, the, the great scroll was reunited with one portion of it, which is in the Hangzhou Museum. And so for the first time in, in a good many years, one could see the whole painting. According to the Times, hundreds of thousands of people lined up to see the reuniting of this, of this great painting, this, this extraordinary uh, image of nature. It, it's a view near Hangzhou and uh, was done during the Song Dynasty, one, one of the great and glorious periods of, of, of Chinese art. Um, if, if we can go to the next slide. This, this is actually not uh, by a Chinese artist, although if some of you thought, after having looked at the, um, at the Huang, uh, Huang Gong Wang painting, you, you, you might be justified in imagining that this is a, 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 a Chinese landscape. Again, it's hills, it's water, it's trees. But in fact, this, this is a drawing by Leonardo da Vinci, it's a Leonardo da Vinci drawing, which is, according to the art historians, the first landscape in Western art of an actual place. 14, it's dated 1473. He gives the name of the place and he dates it. And before that, all the landscapes that we have in Western painting are, are, are generic, are, are, are imaginary places. But here we have the spirit of the Renaissance, the, 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 the expression of... of of actual place. When, when, when Jacob Burckhardt wrote his great history of the Renaissance in Italy, uh, he, he pointed out that it was in Italy, w w w he was defining the Renaissance, he said it was in Italy that for the first time the world was seen to be beautiful. You know, uh, uh, Petrarch climbs to the top of Mount, what is it, in order to look at the landscape. And Kenneth Clark, in his lectures on civilization, said that this was a great defining moment in Western culture, that it's, this world is beautiful, not, not the other world. This, this is it. This is our world. Now, landscape painting as a tradition in the West is very, very recent. It, it begins in, in what in China is the Ming Dynasty. The, in, in China, landscape painting goes back very, very far. Uh, here we have a detail uh, of the same landscape that we, we saw at the beginning, the, the Huang Gong Wang, the, 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 the uh, Fushan Mountains. And, and, and as I said, I wanted you to think of the two, the Leonardo <coughs> image and this, this side by side. In, in the exhibition, uh, we have a, a, an illustration of another detail from this painting, and, and it's juxtaposed against a, 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 a sepia, a, a brown wash drawing by Turner. And, and for the exhibition, I wanted to suggest a certain number of affinities between certain, between certain Western and certain Chinese artists. Well, this is arguably the greatest landscape in, in Chinese art. It certainly, I think, it would make everybody shortlist of the top one or two. Uh, Fan Quan's uh, great painting, uh, Travelers Among Mountains and Streams, like, like the Huang Zhang, like the... Uh, Huang Gong Wang painting, it's, it's in the Taiwan Museum. Uh, when, when, you, when you look at this picture, you may think that it's completely devoid of human life. But virtually all of the great Song masters actually have tiny figures there, travelers, somebody there, uh, 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 wandering through the landscape. Th this is not like the CCTV building, which is to show some great authoritative force looming over us, dominating us, oppressing us, crushing us. For, for, for the great Chinese landscape painters, nature was something that provided comfort and solace and truth and value. Uh, I have a whole list of terms here that I don't have time to read of what, of what both Western and Chinese painters and thinkers uh, 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 saw in nature. Uh, uh, when, when, when the Ming Dynasty collapsed, uh, 
a, a, a group of artists uh, left the, the Ming court, I mean, the, the former Ming court, and, and, and sought refuge in mountains. Some of them became Taoists, a, a religion that seemed to be very, very much suitable for, 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 for worshipers, worshipers of nature. A, a couple of weeks ago, I was in, uh, in Chengdu and went to the mountain Qingchengshan, which is a Taoist mountain, but where the great painter Zhang Dachen, one of the great Chinese painters of the 20, 20th century, where he lived for four years and painted the landscapes uh, of, 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 of that region. Uh, when I was in Hong Kong a few days ago, there was an exhibition of Wu Guangzhong, which showed some more of the landscapes of Sichuan and southern China and western China and so on, pa painted with this extraordinary uh, love of nature and, and, and harking back to traditions as old as this. These are all paintings of thousand years old. This is my favorite Chinese painter. I've loved him for, I, I think, 40 years now, Ma Yuan. In, in, in New York, in America, we're lucky to have little album leaves. He did a lot of little paintings, Ma Yuan. He, he was called One Quarter Ma, because very often his landscapes consisted of a scene just in one quarter of the paper, and the rest is all blank. And it's very often you see a philosopher looking out at a waterfall or nature or something of the sort. L last year, there was an exhibition of some dynasty painting. I happened to be a guest at Tai Da. And there was an exhibition of Song painting at the Taiwan Museum. I had never been there before. And it had my very favorite single Chinese painting, uh, Ma Yuan's painting of a philosopher walking down a pathway. I know Li Hui must know this picture because Li, Li Hui is my, my model, my expert. This is, this is Ma Yuan's painting, which is in the Palace Museum here in Beijing. Happily, it was not carried off in 1948. And here we have great mountain peaks and houses and so forth. But in the foreground here are a group of travelers. And it may be hard to see in the slide, uh, but, but if you look at the painting or look at art books that have details of the painting, there's a group of children here, very happy, dancing, singing. They, these, are, these are people who are not dwarfed by nature. They are in harmony with nature. They're enjoying the singing. Th this is the difference between uh, you know, man's relationship with nature and, and, and something like the CCTV building's relationship to, change, to, to nature. The, the one shows us that we live in a world you know, that has some meaning, some beauty, and the other seems to be a kind of a, a monument to, to, I don't know what, pride, worse than pride. The next image is by Peter Bruegel, and some of you may recognize this. This is, this is the poster of the exhibition, and in the poster, it's painted blue, which makes it look very, very attractive. But when you see it in the Sackler Museum, you will see that it's actually black and white uh, engraving. Uh, Bruegel uh, uh, traveled, uh, he was a painter from, from Northern Europe, Renaissance artist, and he traveled to uh, Italy uh, on foot. He traveled over the Alps into Italy, and he did a number of drawings and uh, uh, the views of the Alps turn up in a number of his paintings, we'll see in a moment. But when he came back to, to Antwerp, the city where he did most of his work, a number of his drawings were transferred to, to, to engraving. And this particular Bruegel is, is, is his masterpiece as an engraving. He did a number of, of, of engravings, but this one is called The Large Alpine Landscape. And, and I wanted you to see this with the Ma Yuan. When, when you go into the exhibition, you'll see the Ma Yuan that you just saw together with this one. And uh, when Ada, when Dear Drew Lu, when I sent her a photo of this a couple of months ago, I, I had just bought this from a French art dealer, and I was so pleased, because Bruegel etchings are, well, they're extremely impossible to find. The, 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 the dealer in Paris knew I was putting together an exhibition of landscape prints, and somehow he got a hold of this, and he got in touch with me, and he said, you have to have it. And uh, it cost me two years of my salary, but I bought it. <laughs> it's here in the exhibition. Uh, we have the Alps here, and we have the, the tiny travelers. There's a, there's a figure on, on, on a donkey uh, up here, and you, you can see Bruegel's signature down below there. Uh, if, if one is going to have a collection of landscape, 
uh, this, this, is, this is where one starts. Leonardo didn't do any etchings, uh, uh, and uh, neither did, did, did most others. The next, the next work, this is Peter Bruegel, one of his paintings. We, we, we think of Bruegel mostly as, as a painter, not as an engraver, although he was a great engraver and a great draftsman. But this is the scene from the, from the New Testament of the conversion of St. Paul, and he has chosen to set it in the Swiss Alps. If, if you remember the Alpine scene in the other etching, he's drawn upon it in his memory to, to, to show these great, great mountain peaks. The, the next Bruegel is, is perhaps the most famous of all of his works. He did a series of paintings uh, illustrating the, the seasons, the, the actually six paintings in the series, of which uh, five survive, uh, uh, three in Vienna, one in the Metropolitan in New York, one in Czechoslovakia. This one is The Hunters in the Snow. It's, it's the winter scene and uh, is, is one of the most, well, I think one of the most beautiful, unforgettable images of Western art. You, you know, when I came to China in 1982, uh, this, was, this was not long after the Cultural Revolution, uh, and one of the saddest things about teaching in China in the early 80s was to discover how very little my students knew about Chinese art. Uh, about the great Chinese artists. Uh, I, I remember once going through a museum with one of my students, and he said to me, oh, he said, I didn't know that we had Chinese had created so many beautiful things. And, and, and I, I must say that really upset me. Uh, now I think you, you are better informed about, about the masterpieces of the last five, 6,000 years. Uh, but there's also a great deal about Western art, which, which I think could, could be taught more in, in, in China. So, so certainly, there will never be a Bruegel exhibition in China. He painted only 25 paintings, and most of them are in Vienna. And they are never lent. They're painted on wood panel, very, very delicate, and they never leave the museums. I've, I've never heard of a Bruegel ever being lent to, another exhibition, to an exhibition anywhere. But this is The Hunters in the Snow, and uh, what, 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 th 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 there's a word for this in German that Tom will know how to pronounce, Weltlandschaft. Uh, the, the attempt to create in a landscape an entire world, an entire, uh, Bruegel's landscape stretch almost into, into infinity. Uh, a, a very great artist. The next artist is Albert Dürer. Dürer and uh, Bruegel are the two greatest artists, the two great Renaissance artists of Northern Europe. Germany, Belgium, Holland, in, in, in that period. And uh, can, can you, Franklin, can you see this from where you are? Is the screen, uh, I'm not locked in the drum. Okay. This, this is a, a Dürer who, who traveled, like Bruegel, to Italy. Uh, he, he, he was a, a somewhat older generation than Bruegel, and uh, he did a number of beautiful landscapes. Uh, watercolors, really, the, the first beautiful watercolor, the first watercolors that we have in Western painting. Uh, this is a scene uh, going from Italy into, from Switzerland to it, Italy, rather. He did, he did a number of beautiful landscapes, uh, a whole little town below this, the town of Arco, and then the hill, the mountain. And he, he made this trip, as, as Bruegel did, on foot. And then he spent some time in Italy looking at the great uh, masters, mostly in Venice, and then, and then he came back home. They, these were works that were not known in his lifetime. The, the watercolors were, were private uh, works of art. But uh, <coughs> the Albertina in Vienna has, a, has the, the major collection of, of Dürer's watercolors. This, this very beautiful, it, it's just called a, a, a piece of turf. It's just a single bit of, of you know, plants in, 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 in earth. Which, which he highlights and, and shows the beauty of. You know, what, what does Blake say about seeing the world in a grain of sand or here in, 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 in a leaf? In, in, in the next. This is the sort of work that Dürer did to make his living. He painted mostly religious paintings for the churches. Uh, this is a lamentation over the dead Christ. But, but you'll notice how he puts, do you see the landscape way, way in the back? In the, in the upper top. And, and every once in a while, his, his love of nature uh, uh, 
I mean, th there was nobody who would buy a, a landscape painting. This was just not a, 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 a form of art that the people in the West, this is not China, remember, regarded as significant. But at every opportunity, when he had a, a subject of some sort, he would incorporate a landscape into it. And that gets us into the next work. No, the, this one. The, this is the Dürer, which is in the exhibition. I, again, finding a Dürer, finding a Bruegel today in, in, in Europe, in, in, most of my dealers are European, it becomes increasingly difficult. Um, it, it, there were about 10 art dealers who supplied me with the artworks that are in this exhibition, and two of them died within the last year. So this, this makes the, the, the chance for finding things increasingly less and less. This is from a series of engravings. The, the actual work, when you see it in the museum, is, is very small, I'm afraid. The, 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 the blow-up, I mean, shows how you can make this thing 50 times bigger than the original, and, and one can still see the clarity of it. But it's from a series of, of, of engravings uh, of the life of Jesus. This is the scene of, 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 of Pontius Pilate washing his hands while Jesus is being led off here to be crucified. But in, 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 in this uh, scene, uh, uh, Dürer cannot resist putting in a little landscape. But we have in the exhibition a blow-up of, of, this, of, of this tiny landscape uh, which, which is really quite tiny when, when you look at it. But again, it's a, it's a little world of houses, villages, streams. There's even a boat, do you see, way on the top, mm -hmm. sailing out to sea. And there, over on the right, the, the crosses have already been set up for, for, for Jesus and the two thieves. Uh, um, it, 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 Panofsky, in his book on, on Dürer, makes a great fuss about the beauty of the, of the landscape in, in this tiny print, which, you know, I, I remember in 1982 uh, attending an exhibition in Beijing of an artist who, who, who drew scenes on human hairs. And if you look through a microscope, you could see, a, a magnifying glass rather, you could see that on a hair he'd drawn a, a tree or, or some little, little object. And, and I thought, well, this, this man would have liked Dürer and vice versa. This is, a, 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 this is the third of the Renaissance artists in the exhibition. We have only three artists in the exhibition from the 16th century. Uh, Bruegel from, from Antwerp, uh, Dürer from Nuremberg, and uh, from France, uh, Etienne Duperac. Uh, Duperac was an architect, actually, who came to Rome in the uh, 16th century, around 1560s, 1570s, and he depicted, he did a series of engravings of ancient Rome as it actually still looked. The, the, the ruins here of the, of the Roman Forum are how they appeared in the year 1575. By the 17th, 18th century, most of the ruins of ancient Rome had been taken down and been used for building blocks. It's, it's like what happened to the Great Wall. In China, people took the old stones and build other things. But when we see the Colosseum in Rome now, it's largely reconstructed. The, 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 the original stones of Rome have, have long since vanished. So Dupirac is, is, is important in terms of art history, that he did the, 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 the images of Rome during the Renaissance when you could still see these old remains uh, uh, before they were knocked down. And of course, when, when I saw this image, uh, uh, my, my most dedicated uh, French uh, dealer friends, the Proutets, that was the dealer I bought my first print from when I was 12 years old. Uh, I've, I've known them for several generations. Uh, I mean, several generations of the, I've been four generations of the same family now. Uh, they, always, they always allow me, they do three catalogs a year, and they let me look through the artworks before the catalogs are issued. So I have my choice before. I mean, I, I, I have a very limited budget. I mean, I, I, I live on a teacher's pension, and, and I get some money here from, 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 my, from my work here. So all of this comes out of my salary. Nevertheless, the chance to get one of these seemed irresistible. And when I looked at these columns, I thought of the Yuan Ming Yuan. You, you'll, you'll see in the exhibition, we have a photograph of the ruins in the Yuan Ming Yuan, 
well, the ruins in the Yuan Ming Yuan are Western styles, so perhaps that's not such a coincidence. Uh, but but there we are. A after I you know I, I looked through, they had twenty of them. I could only afford to buy one of them, but I picked the best. And then afterwards, the catalog was issued, and and uh, Madame Prouté called me up, and she said, "Oh, Donald, you'll be happy to hear that when the catalog was issued, Stanford University called us and wanted to buy the whole set." But we said we had already sold the best one. So Stanford has 19, and Peking University has one. <laughs> this is why I can never tell how long these talks will be. This is Duperac drawing St. Peter's. Michelangelo, at the time the Duperac was in Rome, was designing St. Peter's Church. We think of these buildings in Rome as having lasted forever. But for Duperac, this was like the CCTV building. It was something brand new. And he, 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 he drew this. He, he came back to, to France after this stay in Italy, and he became the architect for Henry IV, Henri IV. And he's primarily known as an architect rather than as an artist. But I thought it was an irresistible chance to have a piece of history and landscape at the same time. OK, now when, when landscapes, when we speak of the tradition of landscape painting, we begin with this one painting by Annibale Carracci a painter from Bologna, a uh, 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 very late 16th, early 17th century. He goes from the Renaissance into the early 17th century. There, there was an exhibition in Paris this year uh, uh, called uh, Ideal Nature, uh, Nature Ideale, and uh, this was the, the most important work in the show. It's, it's, it, it, it's, it's in a museum in Rome. What, what Caracci loved to paint landscape, and he used a religious subject. I mean, one of those popular religious subjects that one could use for landscape is the flight in Egypt. I mean, you see, Mary and Joseph are told that, that their, their son will be put to get death by King Herod, so they take him to safety. And because they're taking him on a voyage, many subsequent artists would use the story of the flight into Egypt as an excuse to paint a landscape. And we have this extremely beautiful painting by, by Annibale uh, 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 it, This This is ideal landscape. This is classical landscape at, at its finest. The, the next one shows the, the classical tradition uh, a generation or so later from a, from a French artist who had moved to, to, to Rome and spent most of his life painting there. This is Nicolas Poussin. Uh, Poussin, they... Uh, Poussin is probably the greatest of all the French artists, a great 17th century master. And uh, again, it's an idealized landscape. But years ago, years ago, I was planning to write a book on landscape, Chinese and Western. And I gave uh, talks on it back in 1991. And uh, I remember reading Poussin's ideas of landscape. Poussin and his friend Claude Laurent, we'll, we'll also see in this exhibition, <coughs> drew lots of drawings from nature. They observed nature. They took walks through nature. When they came to actually paint, however, what they were painting were not the actual scene that they saw, but a kind of idealized version uh, that, that, that came from, from their imaginations and, and their head. But it was an ideal that came from having absorbed nature. And of course, this is the method of much of, of the great Chinese landscape painters, the idea that you absorb nature, and then it's somehow transmitted onto canvas. The subject here is rather marvelous. It's my favorite Poussin painting. It's of the Louvre, and it shows Diogenes. Diogenes is the cynic. Diogenes gives up everything. He, he thinks that we can live without anything, except the only thing he retains is a bowl to drink water from. And one day he sees the man drinking water using his hands. And Diogenes flings away his boat. I don't even need that. This is, this is, this is the self-assured man at home in nature who doesn't need anything of the world of getting and spending. Yes. Uh, this is Claude Gelet, Claude, Claude Laurent. Claude and Poussin were the two great French artists living in Rome in the 17th century and painting idealized landscapes using a, a, a historical, mythological, and so on subjects. This is, this is a scene from the Bible. It's the marriage of Isaac and Rebecca, uh, the, the foreground marriage scene. 
But again, Claude, there was a great Claude show also in Paris this summer of his drawings and some of his etchings and a few of his paintings, and it was to show his homage to nature. The, the painter Turner, we have a Turner in the exhibition. Turner, like most, I think, artists after Claude, looked to Claude as the greatest of all the landscape uh, masters. And uh, uh, Turner left in his will, the, the, he wanted two of his paintings to hang next to two of Claude's paintings. In the National Gallery London, two Claude's, two Turner's, as, as Turner's idea of joining the really great masters. The next Claude, this is one of his great seascape paintings. Uh, uh, it's, it's an attempt in his work to, to recreate the ancient world. And here we have a, a landscape with the embarkation of the Queen of Sheba. Uh, a, a number of Turner's paintings are, are modeled on this style, the structure of classical building, of, of bringing back through the imagination uh, all, all those, imagine he's living in Rome with all of those broken columns and he's imagining what was it like when those broken columns were part of, of, of a real thriving world. This, this is from, uh, um, this is in the exhibition. Richard Erlen is the artist. He's an English artist who did engravings based on a, a, a series of drawings that Claude did. Uh, Claude uh, uh, created a, a, an album, the Liber Veritatis, he called it, the Book of Truth, and uh, it contains small versions of all of his paintings. It's very helpful. We, can, we know which is a, a real Claude and which is a forgery if, if, if there's a record of it in the Liber uh, Veritatis. It, it was owned by the Duke of Devonshire. Uh, it's in the British Museum now, but it, 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 in, in the 18th century, it was owned by the Duke of Devonshire, and somebody got the idea of having an English artist, Earl of 1775, to do uh, engravings based on these Claude uh, drawings, drawings based on his own paintings. Uh, we'll, we'll see later a Turner. A Turner came up with the same idea, the, a, the Liber Studiorum, where he did drawings based on his paintings, and then the, the difference is that Turner himself did the etchings, whereas in Claude's case, these are 100 years after his death. And the next one, well, this is Claude's masterpiece. This is his masterpiece. He did a, about 30 etchings while he was in Rome, mostly in his youth. In, in the great Claude exhibition that I was mentioning at the Louvre this summer, uh, the catalogue referred to this print as le plus beau paysage jamais gravé the most beautiful landscape ever engraved. The Bouvier, it's called. It's a shepherd with his sheep. It's, it's the absolute perfection of pastoral landscape. It's the golden age. Uh, Claude is the great poet of the golden age in, in his work. It's a small etching, extraordinarily rare. It's the same art dealer who found me, the Peter Bruegel, who found me the Rembrandt. Again, when, when, he, when he came up with this print, I thought, well, if we could have the Bruegel and the Rembrandt and the Claude, then we could have a really nice show, mm -hmm. as Ed Sullivan used to say. Next. Okay, this is a French artist of the 18th century. The, the exhibition is not filled just with famous artists. There are a number of artists who are not particularly well-known even in the West. Jean-Jacques de Boissieu was the leading landscape uh, artist from Lyon, the second city of France. But to be the second city in France after Paris really meant like being the 20th city because Paris tends to dominate uh, culture in France. Boissieu had been to Italy. Uh, he came back to France and he did a number of, of, of landscapes that are both, uh, these etchings, I should say, that are, that are partly idealized and partly based on actual scenes. This is supposed to be a landscape in France but it contains the Temple of Vesta, which is in Rome, and it contains a mountain from the south of France. He's, he's put all of these elements together uh, for, for, for rather charming uh, work, which is very much in the spirit of, of Claude. Um, Boissieu. In, in the exhibition, there's another Boissieu done of, of a small town in Rome, which is, which is a very realistic one. This is, this is another artist of the 17th century from France. Jacques Callot in 1630 drew two, uh, two etchings of Paris. They, they, they give us a very, very good uh, sense of what Paris looked like. Uh, this one is of the Pont Neuf. The Pont Neuf, which means new bridge, is actually the oldest bridge in Paris. That's this. 
across here with the statue of Henry IV, and in the distance you can see Notre Dame Cathedral, mm. and the Tour de Nel here in the middle, and in the very center of the picture, a man urinating. <laughs> this, this, is, this is a very realistic, I'm afraid, view of Paris as it looked in 1630. It's, it's one of two works that Callot did. The other is a view of the Louvre as the Louvre looked in, in 1630. It was the palace of the Louvre centuries before it was turned into a museum. Do, do we have the Louvre too? Yes, we do. This is, this is the companion. You, you'll notice the two of them in the exhibition are framed in this, they're, they're, they're in the same frame, they're mounted in the same frame. This is the ancient palace of the Louvre, which was at one time the official residence of the kings and queens of France. And we're looking at the same scene, here's the same tower as in the other view, but from looking from one side of the Seine to the right bank or looking to the left bank. And of course the principal means of travel in those days, they didn't have subways, so you travel by boat from one part of the city, like London in the time of, of Shakespeare. The next work, this is by an, an artist who, uh, this is an Italian artist, uh, a, a little bit younger than Callot. Callot was French, but he actually studied engraving in Italy and then went, went back to France, although he did a lot of his work in Italy. This is uh, Stefano della Bella, whose work is entirely done in Italy, and it's done about the same time as the two Callot prints that we just saw. This is Rome in the 1630s. It's the, uh, the Castel Sant'Angelo, opera buffs know that this is where Tosca leaps off at the end of the opera to her death. It was, it was a Roman fortress built for the Emperor Hadrian 2,000 years ago. And unfortunately, the clouds here obscure the fact that St. Peter's Church uh, is, 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 is in the distance there. In the exhibition, there's a reproduction of a Corot painting showing both the Castel Sant'Angelo and, and the St. Peter's next to it. The next one, well, now we come to, to, to from, 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 from uh, prints and, and from a certain number of idealized landscapes, the clause, to, to what I call the cityscape. Uh, 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 artists in Holland in the 17th century uh, began to, to depict their own cities and, and uh, in the 18th century artists of Venice began to follow suit. Uh, this, is, this is perhaps the most important, most beautiful landscape in all of Western art. Uh, when Proust was dying, the great French author, uh, he asked, uh, the, the, the painting had been, was on exhibit in Paris and he asked to be brought in literally on, on, a, on his cot to have one last look at it, a famous description of this in his great novel, A la Recherche. It's the view of Delft. Uh, there's a very good recent book by um, a man named Brooke, uh, which, which studies uh, 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 Vermeer and his connections with China. Uh, Timothy Brooke's book called, uh, I think it's called Vermeer's Hat, something like that. I gave a copy to Genda, so perhaps I can have it printed up for here. But he said that if you look at Vermeer's paintings, you find a lot of China references, because Holland in the 17th century was a, a major trading power, and they sent uh, boats to, 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 to China. It, it was the blue and white Ming porcelain that came back to Holland that created the Delft blue and white. It was a copy of, of, the, of, the, of the Ming blue and white. Uh, and Brooke points out in his book that this view... He, According to the book, if you look carefully at Vermeer's paintings, each of them has a door in it, which if you can find the handle, will take you into China. And in this particular work, what, what we have here is the headquarter of the East India Company. The boats that are actually moored here are the boats that the merchants took. I, I mean, Delft is now a rather sleepy little town in Holland, but it was a major uh, uh, commercial center in the 17th century. From, from those little boats, uh, uh, that, that was, that was the, the access to China from, from, from the Western traders. The view of Delft. Oh, this is Peter Paul Rubens. R Rubens painted, um, well, he painted uh, for the, the kings of uh, Spain, France, England. Uh, uh, he, he, he was the most decorated artist. He was the first artist, as far as I know, to become a knight, Sir Peter Paul Rubens, he painted for the, 
for, for Charles I, the, the, what, what he came to England, and he, he was sent all over Europe uh, uh, to do commissions, but also um, to do diplomatic. But, but Rubens loved landscape. This was not a, a, a kind of a, a art form that was popular, so he seems to have painted these landscapes for his own pleasure. He, he owned this little country estate outside of Antwerp, the Chateau of Steen, and he did this. It, the, the reproduction is too murky, I'm afraid. It, 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 I wish you could see it with all the color intact. You have a hunter here, for example, and he's looking at a group of ducks, but I, for the life of me, I can't see the ducks. They, they somehow. It, it must be one of Beijing's uh, falls, as they call it, <laughs> that has somehow hit the Belgium on that day, and the ducks have vanished behind the fog. But, but it, 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 it's uh, extremely beautiful. The, the landscape was five feet long, a very large size for a landscape, the biggest, I think, that had been used so far. And it was owned by, in, in, in the 19th century by a famous uh, English collector, Sir George Sir George Beaumont, Beaumont, who inspired the Peel Castle, you know, poem of, of, of Wordsworth. Uh, and Beaumont encouraged Constable, the young English landscape artist. And Constable was the first English artist to do a series of landscapes following this model, the five-foot landscape, the Hayway. We'll, we'll, we'll see, I think, examples later. Although, unfortunately, Constable did no prints. But we're, we're looking at Dutch prints now. All, all of these prints are in the exhibition, by the way. This is Anthony Waterlow, who, who, who did some paintings, but mostly made his living by producing these prints. I mean, in Protestant Holland, where there was no church to commission works of art, religious works of art, the artists had to work for a middle-class public that wanted to have pretty images to put up on their walls. And one of the images, the sort of image they liked, was landscape. Uh, Waterlow did hundreds of etchings. But this is one of the very few that has a, a, a mythological subject. It's, it's the scene of, of uh, Mercury and Argus, way, way, way over there on the right. And, and again, Professor Rendell will have to explain the myth to you, because my mind has gone absolutely brain dead at this moment. But, but Tom will know, that is for sure. The, the next one... Windmills, the Dutch windmills. We, we, you'll see in the exhibition at least three works uh, containing windmills in the Sacra. This is Jacob Roysdale, the, the greatest of the Dutch landscape painters. Uh, 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 Roysdale's skies, his clouds, are perhaps the most beautiful. He, he was an artist copied and influential among all the English artists who followed him. Gainsborough, Constable, Crome, all, all, all followed his example and in, in some cases did actual copies, <coughs> full-scale copies of his works. The mill in, in, in this is a windmill in, in Holland, and, and one, one of Roysdale's most beautiful points. He was a very melancholy man, poor Roysdale, and he stopped painting at a certain point. He did five etchings, only five of them. They are very hard to find, I assure you. And this is perhaps the most famous of a beech tree with two tiny travelers here on the left. And uh, um, their, their interesting expression of the Dutch landscape spirit. Uh, now we have the greatest of all the Dutch artists. This is Rembrandt. Rembrandt's most famous uh, uh, landscape etching. R Rembrandt did, oh, I don't know how many hundreds of etchings, but only about 20 or 30 at the most are devoted to landscape. And if you have two or three million dollars, any of you, you could perhaps buy an impression of this and give it to the college. It, it's, it's not in the exhibition, I'm sorry to say. But this is the three trees. At one time, I wanted to have a reproduction of it, but we couldn't fit it into the cabinet. So, so this is all, all we have here. But it's a, 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 a rather beautiful a landscape of three trees and a cloud, a very expressive uh, cloud scene and a, a landscape stretching back. We do have, oh, oh no, here, here is his painting of a windmill, uh, a, a painting by Rembrandt which inspired Turner to do a painting very similar to it, which, which then Turner made an etching out of it, and the Turner etching is, is in the exhibition. Uh, uh, the Turner was shown in last year's exhibition of 19th century, uh, so it's being shown for the second time, and for that exhibition we had the reproduction of the, of the Rembrandt um, nearby. It, it's a very interesting to take a very humble subject and, and treat it so dramatically. 
Yes, this is the Rembrandt which, which the Sackler Museum has. Mm. It's a very, very small thing, but it's real. It's, it's, it's a little scene of a cottage with a cow drinking from a pool, and uh, like most of his landscape etchings, they're just notations, like most of his drawings and, and the etchings, there are a few strokes to, to, to bring the subject to life. Uh, although uh, Simon Sharma, in his book on Rembrandt, points out, he mentions this etching, and he says, but look, Rembrandt has all these hills in the background, and Holland has no hills. So even Rembrandt, the most realistic of artists, felt, well, a little, a little something extra to, to give the composition that, that extra quality. This is, as far as we know, I, we may be wrong here, but Dr. Solomon, I think that this is perhaps the only Rembrandt in the possession of a Chinese public collection. Maybe there's somebody in Shanghai that has a Rembrandt on their wall, but I've certainly never heard of anything of the sort. So this may be a unique thing. Mm -hmm. Yes. And here we have Canaletto. We have a very pretty Canaletto etching of Venice. Canaletto came a hundred years after Vermeer, and his subject was also depicting a city, a cityscape. And in this case, you know, arguably the most beautiful city in the Western world. Uh, but when 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 I was in when we were in Macau just a week ago, we went to one of the casinos called the Venetian, and they've actually recreated the Grand Canal with the. Remember, am I, am I wrong? There was actually a gondolier singing Italian songs. We have the photos taken there. That, that, that was to recreate this, so, so that if you were tired of gambling, you could pretend you were in in, in Venice for for a few moments. I never thought I would enjoy being in a casino, but it, it was rather delightful. Even the, the, the sky, the, the ceiling was painted to look like these beautiful clouds. It was really quite remarkable. The Venetian, that's the name of it. Anyway, this is the Grand Canal. This is the Santa Maria della Salute, the, the great 18th century church in Venice that was built during the plague, the hope that the, Our Lady of Health, that it would restore the city to, to good health. And this is... You know, a rather fabulous uh, Canaletto of, of St. Mark's, the, the, the great uh, St. Marco, the great Byzantine church with the horses which they got from Turkey and the Venderman Tower and this, this, uh, this square. Uh, Henry, Henry James in, in The Wings of the Dove calls this the, the drawing room of Europe. You know, and he has a marvelous passage in, in The Wings of the Dove and also in the Aspirin Papers to, to, to a number of important events take place in both novels that are set in, in this great piazza, this great public square in Venice. The, well, here we have the same square and by the same artist, but this is Canaletto doing the Piazza San Marco, looking away from the church, from the church in, in, in the other direction, looking north. And it's a, it's a rainy day, even in the most beautiful city in the world, it rains. There, there are the Venetians holding up their, their, their umbrellas. And here we have the Piazza San Marco. And this is in the exhibition. Canaletto did about 30 prints. Again, extremely rare and beautiful things. And when we come to city artists, I suppose nobody is more, uh, uh, certainly better known in the West than, than Piranesi. Uh, Giuseppe Battista Piranesi, who did uh, 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 views of, of Rome. Uh, Giovanni Battista Piranesi. Uh, we have six of them in the exhibition. And I think they look, they're, they're in the second room of the exhibition, so don't forget to go into both rooms when you see the exhibition. But we have six of them. Uh, uh, they, they, they came from six different art dealers. I had to find one from, uh, but, but I found six of them. And, one of them was through the generosity of friends in Washington who knew somebody who had a print who was willing to, 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 to sell. This is the Piazza di Spagna, which is actually a, a, a relatively modern. This is 70, this is Baroque uh, uh, Rome. It, it shows a great square. It's called the Piazza di Spagna because the Spanish uh, uh, nobility and the Spanish embassy were located here. The famous Spanish steps, all, all travelers to Rome go up these steps and to see the church of San Trinità del Monte. But for a literature lover, the most important part of this etching 
is, is this window right here, because that's the room where John Keats died in. Oh, really? Keats spent his last six months in Rome, and he lived in, it's now a museum, he lived in, in this apartment on the, the Spanish steps. So, of course, this was an image that I had to find, <laughs> being, being, as some of us are great lovers of Keats. But this is, this is a real tradition. And the next period, we have six periodesis. We have, a, we have reproductions of, of, of all six of them. This is the Quirinale, the, the, the statues of Castor and Pollux. Uh, this building over here, at one time the popes used to live in the Quirinale Palace, and then they were moved out. And now uh, the, 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 the president of, of Italy lives in the Quirinale Palace. They, they just kept changing. I think there's a new president at the moment. But it's on one of the hills. Rome has its famous hills, and the Quirinale Hill is one of the famous hills of Rome. And if you notice, Piranesi is showing how the old city of Rome is being knocked down to make way for the new one. So here we have just the ruins of columns here in the foreground, and then these new, well, modern buildings, 17th, 18th century buildings, are going up on the sides. Oh, this is the most famous fountain in Europe, the, the Trevi Fountain, the Fontana di Tre Trevi. If you have the, take the little brochure, you'll notice there's a reproduction over here. Um, there was a, a, a movie, Barbara and I, who are film buffs, will remember, called Three Coins in the Fountain. Remember? That was the idea that you throw a coin into the Trevi Fountain and you will, you will meet the person you're going to marry, or you will come back to Rome, or both. Maybe you throw on a lot of coins, you get a lot more issues, and people still do to this day. Uh, in modern film, this is where Marcello Mastroianni wanders in, in La Dolce Vita, into the, into the, into the, into the I think Lee Shang plays what I'm talking about. This is the Colosseum. Now, uh, these, these are, I think, we can hope, some of the original stones of, 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 of the building. The, the amphitheater built for, for, for military spectacles, and the Arch of Titus uh, here. Uh, uh, one of the great landmarks in, in, in Rome. And what's next? Oh, the Ponte Solario. This is a, a Roman bridge, 2,000 years old. It's, uh, there's a, a fortification on the top where the soldiers used to, to look out for enemies approaching. Very imposing structure. The first time I went to Rome, I had these images of Piranesi in my head, and I expected everything to look as big as grandiose. And very often they turned out to be small ponds and small buildings. So there's a certain imagination <coughs> that goes to work here, but, but the effect is, is, is quite marvelous. And he, he lived by making these prints. Travelers would come to Rome, and these were the souvenir uh, uh, you know, snapshots at the time you took away, great big ones, nevertheless. Is there another one? Yes, uh, the, 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 the last of the series of uh, views that he did of Rome were, were done in Tivoli. And this was the ruined palace of the Emperor Hadrian. And uh, but by the 18th century, you see the, the ceilings had fallen in. And uh, uh, he was very much impressed by the darkness. I mean, you see this very unhappy looking man standing very melancholy on the side. And images like this were to have great influence on the romantics, the, 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 the aesthetic of the ruins. Uh, 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 were, were, were to be, were to be uh, popular. I think De Quincey somewhere talks about Piranesi's use of ruins. Uh, but but a, a very, very imposing uh, image uh, by Piranesi. Okay, we have a little etching in the exhibition by Paul Sandby. Sandby is considered the father of English watercolor paint, painting, and he also did a lot of landscapes, and he was the court painter for the King of England. So here we have a, a Windsor Castle uh, painted by Sandby. We, we have a little Sandby in the exhibition of a, an elegant couple in a, in a forest landscape. The, the next one, but we don't have, a, 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 sorry, an illustration of the, the Sandby. You'll, you'll have to see that. John Crome is, is an early English landscape artist, very much influenced by Roysdale and the Dutch. When, when, when my, one of my dealers sent me the, the photo of this through the computer, when I looked at it, I thought, gee, this is really ugly. And then I thought, gee, it's trees, a little few shacks, a little little path. 
uh, it, it took a while for, for this image to grow on me because Crone was really trying to find beauty in the humble. I mean, I mean, this is a perfect sort of Wordsworthian setting, and it's done exactly in the time of Wordsworth to find to find something beautiful or interesting in the absolutely ordinary and everyday. And 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 Crone, as I said, comes very very early. This is a generation before Turner and Constable and the others. So so I went ahead and bought it, and you'll have to decide for yourself whether it was worth acquiring or not. Ah. Oh. This is Richard Parts Bonington. When, when you study the great British artists, you discover that a lot of them died very, very young. Bonington died at the age of 26, for example. Uh, he, he studied in France. He did a number of, of beautiful images. We, we have one of, in, in, in the exhibition of, the, uh, of a tower in, in Normandy. But this, this is a Bonington uh, taken in Edinburgh. Edinburgh is sometimes called the most beautiful city in Europe. It, 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 it has a castle on a hill. Uh, it's really quite, quite, a, quite a beautiful, beautifully designed city. And uh, uh, because of Sir Walter Scott's popularity, people would visit Scotland to look at the places mentioned in Scott's novels. But this is the capital city of Scotland, uh, Edinburgh. And this is, this is the other Bonington in the exhibition. Richard Parks Bonington, the, uh, the uh, what is this called? The Tour de something, something, something. The Tour de Grosse Horloge, Evreux. That's, that's, that's Bonington, the rather immense, beautiful Gothic structure. And this is the beginning of the time, by the way, when artists are beginning to find the old buildings being interesting and beautiful. The Gothic, the word Gothic was a term of insult for, for years, and now suddenly Gothic little towers and so on uh, were, were suddenly considered to, to have beauty a little bit before. Believe it or not, some would say this is the single most beautiful thing. If you go to France, go to Mont Saint-Michel. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a, such a tiny... <laughs> it's such a tiny... Uh, uh, but um, it is the great uh, abbey. On, on, on a hill and surrounded by water. At certain points during the day, the tide recedes, and uh, uh, the French call it the merveille, the marvel. But until the Romantics, <coughs> this was just considered an ugly old religious building made during the, the, the Middle Ages and therefore completely lacking in, 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 in any interest. If, if, you, if you look at the print of the exhibition, this is in the exhibition you'll see that there are a group of people in the foreground holding up their hands and looking very depressed. And the reason is that there's a stretch somewhere in one section of the sand, what, what the French call sable de mouvant, quicksand. And so they're looking for somebody or something that has disappeared into the, into the quicksand and sucked off away forever. And you'll see somewhere in this thing a, 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 an animal's bones of a poor animal that others are. That gives this a certain romantic quality. This is John Sel Kaufman, the first English artist to travel to France after the end of the Napoleonic Wars, because of the wars between England and France. Travel to, to the continent was limited for a good many years. So Kaufman traveled around on foot, and he did these wonderful drawings, and then he did a, the series of etchings, and we have three of them in the exhibition. That, that he did from Normandy. This is the Turner I was talking about. This is, this is Turner himself did the etching. It was inspired by the Rembrandt painting of the, of the windmill. And it's, 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 a, it's an image that John Ruskin, in his book on modern painters, uh, discusses in two separate volumes of his work. Uh, Ruskin is struck by the fact, or at least Ruskin makes the point of saying, that whereas for earlier artists, the windmill was seen as a picturesque subject, you know, a, a beautiful, an interesting building on top of a hill, he says in Turner's work, you see human toil, work, labor. He says there is no joy in Turner's mill. And he reproduces this in, in modern painters and discusses it. A very interesting image. You can see in the etching what Turner is trying to do is to create the effect of, of a watercolor, of, of a sepia wash, although, in fact, it, it's a print. Well, one of my 
favorite English art dealers, Lowell Libson in London. Uh, uh, I, 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 I had mentioned, you know, the dealers all knew that I was looking for works for this exhibition, and for this exhibition I wanted to have some drawings as well as prints. I, I donated two for my collection, and three I bought specially for this. Uh, um, Lowell is a great fan of Cornelius Varley. He and his brother were famous English watercolorists of the early 19th century. It's a view taken in, in Wales, Ben Gellert, and, and, and it's looking at one of the Welsh mountains. Uh, in, in, in Cornelius Farley's style, you'll see, is, is just a few, almost Chinese, a, a minimum of brush strokes to create a sense of atmosphere. And uh, we, ha we have a Cornelius Varley drawing. When, when Lowell heard about this, he donated a very important drawing by, by Varley to the museum. It's, it's a view of Bayswater, uh, which, which at the time he drew it, Bayswater is now a very central part of London, but it was, it was, it, it was outside of London at the time that Varley it, it, it drew, drew the image of Bayswater and uh, the Hyde Park trees and so on. This is the same artist, Cornelius Varley, and this artist, uh, Paul Huet, is, is perhaps the leading French Romantic uh, landscape artist. There, there, there are a lot of affinities between French Romanticism and British Romanticism. The British Romantics, like Bonington, studied in France. The French Romantics regularly went to London to see Shakespeare plays and also to do English scenery. But, but this is a rather wild landscape, by the way, it's in the exhibition of a heron, the, the bird here, and then various other animals, and these twisted trees of this very expressive sense of nature. Uh, this is uh, Theodore Rousseau. Rousseau was the leader of a group of French artists who are called the Barbizon painters. They lived, uh, they, rather, they worked from a small town in France called Barbizon, and uh, near, near Fontainebleau, near the forest of Fontainebleau, which, which has a famous castle going back to the Renaissance. But the Barbizon painters did not paint the royal palaces they painted the, the trees, the, the, the landscapes in, 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 in Barbizon and in Fontainebleau. And uh, Rousseau was particularly in love with these great, uh, with these great uh, uh, trees. Here, we see here these paintings of, uh, this painting of oak trees, which is in the Louvre Museum in Paris. And in, in the next uh, slide... This is, this is, Rousseau did a few prints, very, very, very few. This is his most famous. There was an exhibition in Washington, the National Gallery, a few years ago on the subject of the, the artists of Barbizon, the Fontainebleau artists. And uh, this was one of the central images in the exhibition. It's a, it's a very small etching, but it's Rousseau's paintings, again, of the same trees, but another part, another part of the forest in, in Fontainebleau. Very concentrated, very powerful image. Oh, Daubigny. We have actually a whole cluster, about six or seven of the Barbizon artists, both in, 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 as etchers and in, in drawings in the exhibition. This is Charles Daubigny. Le Marais, that's a marsh. It's a marsh scene with, again, the heron, the birds here. It's a small image, very powerful, very dense. And there's a painting very similar to this in the Louvre. It's not sure whether he did the etching before he did the painting or the painting before he did the etching. Daubigny lived in Auvergne in, uh, in France, and uh, he was particularly revered by the next generation. Daubigny Corot welcomed the young painters, and he was known to be a friend to young painters. And when Vincent van Gogh chose to move to Auvergne the last uh, few months of his life, it was to be in the city where Daubigny lived, and, and some of Van Gogh's last paintings are, were of Daubigny's house and his garden, a sort of an homage of a, a, a younger painter to, to the older generation, to painters who saw in nature a, 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 a source of, of inspiration. And, and the next one, this is, this is Jules Dupré, a, another one of the Barbizon artists. It, there, are, there are windmills, not, not just in Holland, but in France too. This is in Sologne. In, in the Loire Valley. When you go into the exhibition, you'll see a giant reproduction of a, a, a giant uh, uh, thing from, from ceiling to floor 
of, of, of just the central portion of it. But it looks rather marvelous, I think. And the next one, this is Eugène Isabe. Isabe was the leading French marine painter of the 19th century. He painted uh, uh, seaside towns. We have in the exhibition both one of his drawings of Normandy and also uh, this, this uh, lithograph, which is taken in Brittany. It's called Souvenir of Brittany. And it's just a fishing village, the, the boats uh, moored to the, to the docks there and the, the people going about their business. We, we have a whole section of the exhibition devoted to the artists who painted the French, uh, the scenes in Normandy, Etretat and Mont Saint-Michel and, and this. And, and the next one. Well, this is, this is Daumier. A, a, a couple of years ago, we had an entire exhibition devoted to Daumier, and all of those Daumiers are now in Macau. If you go to Macau, the Macau Museum has borrowed the Sacklers, Daumiers, and Delafois, and Picassos, and so on. But we, we retained, I insisted that uh, the, uh, Macau couldn't have this one. We, we have this one uh, 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 Daumier. Daumier was a friend of all these artists we just looked at, Dupre, Daumier, Corot, they, they were close friends of his. And uh, all of them had, the same, had to put up with the same problem of this poor artist. I mean, they painted out of doors. They wanted to show the atmosphere of the scene exactly as it looked. The, the, the earlier artists, Karachi and others, Poussin would have painted in a studio, but these artists wanted to paint on the spot. The French call this plein air. And if you paint out of doors, you will be bothered by people looking over your shoulder. And, and the caption here is, the man is saying to the painter, you're painting the landscape, aren't you? Is that true? Aren't you painting a landscape? <laughs> if he had eyes, he could see that he's painting a landscape. But this is Daumier's little homage to, to shall we say, the, the, some of the misfortunes that, that landscape artists have to face. <laughs> okay. Oh, this is Corot. This was the most wonderful of all the French landscape painters. We have two Corot uh, etchings. Corot went to Italy as a young man. He, he drew everywhere in France. The, the, there is a mislabeling in the exhibition. It's called the bridge at Nantes because Google Image says Nantes. But Google Image is wrong. It's Mount. And, and I told the students at the beginning, it's an M, but they prefer to believe Google Image than Donald. What can I say? <laughs> but I've seen this picture in the Louvre, and I have several books on Corot, and I can assure you it's Mount. Le Pont à Mont. And it's, it's quintessential Corot. Uh, Corot, who, who, who traveled every, every section of France, he, he traveled, uh, the, the most beloved of the French landscape artists and kind and generous. When, when, when Daumier went blind in his old age, Corot provided him with a pension and a house to live in. That was, that was he was the kindest, perhaps, artist I've, I've ever read about. And his landscapes are full of warmth and charm and heart and feeling. And we have two of those. This painting had to be here. This is a view of Tivoli. Remember I said Corot came to Italy as a young man, and he did a number of, of beautiful paintings in Italy. The, when I first came to China in 1982, the Louvre Museum lent to China a hundred masterpieces, a hundred great French paintings from the Louvre. E each, each artist was a David, an Ingres, a Vato, a Boucher, Every single one of them was represented, and there was no catalog in those days, a great pity, uh, uh, and no website in those days. But every time I'm in the Louvre, I can remember most of those hundred pictures. And when I come to this Corot, I remember that in 1982, this Corot painting of Tivoli uh, hung at the, at the, uh, the Art Exhibition Center. It, it was just, north of the, just near the zoo area in, in, in Beijing one of the most beautiful things. The, the, Europe was just beginning to recognize that, 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 as Napoleon said, China was awakening. And so they began to send beautiful things. Uh, and, and in 82, this, this exhibition of the Louvre was, was one of the very great ones. Anyway, next one. This, this is one of the souvenirs he did. Years later, he, he, he created... Uh, these, these imaginary views of Rome or these evocations of Rome. I, I suppose this is probably St. Peter's here. 
as St. Peter's might look if it were somewhere in the middle of the forest of Barbies on the continent. <laughs> but but it's, it, the, the, this rather beautiful impressionistic corros, we have two of them in the exhibition. I think they're, they're rather nice. This is Charles Merion. Merion, it was a rather eccentric artist who unfortunately spent his last years in a madhouse. But he, he drew a, a, about a dozen a, a, a etchings of Paris that are among the greatest images of Paris. If, if you've ever seen the famous image of the gargoyles on top of Notre Dame, it's, it's Merion. You, they sell them in all the postcards shops in, in Paris. He, his, his Paris is the Paris of Victor Hugo. It's a very... Uh, 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 old and in some cases menacing city, full of dark shadows. It, it, we, we'll have a we'll have this in the exhibition with a group of views of Notre Dame and different artists see Notre Dame, the great Our Lady Cathedral, in, in different ways. But he was much revered by the Romantics and Baudelaire and others thought that thought he was he was a very great artist. So I was very happy to find this from one of my French dealers. Uh, the next one. Well, it's again Notre Dame. I, I, I wanted the students to scan this and put this in the section with those Notre Dame images, but somehow they didn't. This is, this is the young Matisse, poor, with a studio facing Notre Dame. It's on the Quai Saint-Michel, and he's, he's beginning his style, what will be called fauvism. Brilliant, brilliant bright color. I thought that case needed some color in it, and I thought this, this image would have given it some... some some, some nice dash and splash. But here, here, here we have it. Uh, Matisse, Matisse worked in the studio for a number of years, and we will see, you will see in the exhibition an etching of Notre Dame, which was drawn from looking out of the window uh, from, the, from the same position. The next one... Well, yes, this is it. This is, this is, the, this is uh, Matisse in 1936. It, it did this for the French... The French had a World's Fair exhibition in 1936. And Matisse contributed this. Is you 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 know when 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 China had its its uh, Olympics, Wu Guangzhong did posters uh, to, to to raise money for the Olympics. Similarly, artists for the French exhibition donated their their talents in order to raise money for the building. So here we have Matisse. This is Picasso. We we don't have a Picasso in the exhibition for the simple reason that Picasso never did landscape etchings. Uh, and the Picassos that are in the Sackler are, are all in Macau at the moment, in, in any case, but they don't have any landscapes. This is a Cubist landscape. This is one of the very few landscapes that Picasso did. It was taken in Spain just at the period where he was beginning to evolve Cubism. He had been studying Cezanne. He had noticed how Cezanne was creating landscapes with simplified forms, cubes, rectangles, circles, and so on. And this is one of his earliest Cubist works. Or you, you can see the landscape, I mean, it's, it's an actual site, but, but it's being turned into, into geometrical forms. And in the exhibition, we have a reproduction of this, and next to it, we have a Wu Guangzhong of the city of Chongqing in Sichuan, which is also a cubist landscape on top of a hill. Very, very much indebted, I think, to Picasso, and maybe even to this very painting. The next one... Yes, we, we don't have a Cubist etching, we don't have a Picasso in the exhibition, but we do have a Jacques Villon. Villon was of the second generation Cubist. Uh, uh, what, around 1911, the, 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 the second generation of Cubists exhibited their works. I mean, Picasso and Braque were painting these revolutionary works. Cubism is arguably the greatest 20th century art movement. Uh, and it influenced a number of younger artists, of, of whom Villon was one of the most important. And here you can see how he takes this the city of Chevreuse in France with the mountains and the church and the buildings and two bicyclists, two nice circles here, a nice Cézanne circle. And, and that is in our exhibition. Villon's brother was Marcel Duchamp, who created something called Dadaism, about which the less said the better. But, but Villon was, 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 uh, did, did some very beautiful prints and beautiful paintings in his life. Oh, this is, this is something I have lent to the exhibition for my personal collection. I, I, ha I have friends who, when they come to my apartment in New York, say, Donald, please, please, they know I've given a lot of my stuff away over the last 20 years. They say, please, 
I'm, I'm afraid they'll stop seeing me if they find this is not on the wall, that they've just been coming to see this rather than me. But this is Pierre Bonal, the, the last of the Impressionists. Uh, this was 1899, uh, uh, Le Verger. It's, it's an orchard, and a woman is carrying laundry. She's just been doing their children are playing here. There's a little pool here. And uh, this, this, is, this is one of... Th- this, is a, this is a print that I waited 20 years. The Proutés, my friends, knew how much I wanted this. And finally, about 20 years ago, they sent me a letter and they said, Don Louis, we found it for you. So, so, so that was how I acquired it. Bonnard was a great, great colorist. And when you see the original, you'll, you'll see the brilliant. It's, it's like a symphony in green. This is Chagall. This, this is also something I'm loaning to the Southway. This is, this is not going to come here while I'm alive, and I can't give it because, and not because the artist is Chagall. I've already given lots of Chagalls to the museum here, but it's a, it's a little town in Russia that Chagall depicted. Uh, uh, it, it's, it's, the, it's the scene where he grew up in, in, in Vitebsk, what is now called Ukraine, but was, was Russia in Chagall's day. It, it's one of a series of illustrations for Gogol's novel, The Dead Souls, but perhaps the most famous of the images. It was a gift given to me by my Russian father, who, when he saw this, we saw this at the Proutés about 50 years ago, and he said, this looks exactly like the town where I, he told me where he grew up. So, so this is, this is a, a, a netting of, of, of great... Uh, you know, personal thing. But Chagall is whimsical. But he, he was the artist for whom the term surrealist was first coined. Apollinaire, the poet, said of, of, of Chagall, he's not a realist, he's a surrealist. He, he, he does things beyond nature. And, and you know, you have the animals, uh, this, is, this seems to be a, an animal seated playing the piano in the middle of town. Well, Chagall, why not? Next. And this is from a series of marvelous etchings. This I did give to the Sackler, illustrating the fables of La Fontaine. There was, there was an outcry at the time that they, that they would have commissioned a Russian artist to illustrate a great French literary classic. But, but, uh, but there is, in fact, Krilov's fables in, in, in Russian. Isn't that a Krilov? And the Krilov fables are very close to the, to the skirt of La Fontaine. Oh, um, can we go back to the previous one? Sorry. It's, it's, it's a scene showing a, a, a farmer with larks. And La Fontaine is a 17th century poet at uh, the court of Louis XIV. And his fables are about animals, but they're really about human nature. They're, they're all of them little lessons about human nature. And the story in this particular fable is one day a farmer says to his son, he says, it, it looks as if the, the grain is ready to be cut down. I'm going to ask the friends from the West to come and help cut it down tomorrow. And when the, the baby larks hear it, they say to the mother, oh, oh, we'd better get out of here, we'd better move. And the mother says, no, nah, we, can, we can stay. And the farmer waits for his friends from the West to come, and they don't come. So the farmer says, well, I'll ask my friends from the East to come and help me to cut down the grain. And again, the baby larks say, oh, we should move, we should... No, the the friends from the east don't come either. On the third day, the mother lark, the the farmer says, well, it looks as if I'll have to do it myself. And the mother lark says, okay, pack your bags. (laughs) It's, 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 It's God helps those who help themselves, I think is the problem. Uh, Next. This is, you, you know, in this, in this exhibition, there are a lot of famous artists like Chagall and Bonnard and Rembrandt and Bruegel. There are also artists who are very, very little known, both in the West uh, or, 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 or outside of the West. And it, 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 in some cases, you know, part of the pleasure of being an art collector is finding beautiful images by relatively obscure artists. This is Edgar Chaim. Shaheen's problem is that he was Armenian. I, I don't know very many art books devoted to Armenian art. He was Armenian. He, he, he was born in Vienna. He grew up in Istanbul. He studied art in Italy. And he lived in France. And he did, he, he did, he did a series of, mostly of, of, of uh, images of, of uh, people, ordinary people, 
but he did a number of etchings in Venice of, of extreme beauty. This, they seemed to me, when, when I was looking at the dealers, I wanted images of Venice, and they said, Shaheen, and I said, who is Shaheen? And then they came up with something from Google, uh, Leonardo Scascia, the most famous of all Sicilian writers of the 20th century, actually wrote a book devoted to Shaheen. So I thought, well, my goodness, that, that means he must be important. But the images are, are quite beautiful. In, there are two Shaheens in the exhibition. One is the, of the Piazza San Marco, uh, the most famous spot. We, we saw one view by Canaletto, but in the Shaheen view, you'll actually see the church of San Marco and the tower, and I think it's, 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 it's very beautiful. Print. And he used old papers. He looked through the bookstores and he would use uh, ancient papers to print his work on. So if you look carefully, you'll see it's on a blue paper. And this is the Casa di Mori in Venice. It's, it's a Gothic building here, but this is the Venice that the tourists do not see. These are just ordinary people going about their business. A gondola is, is, is parked over here children are playing. And uh, I, 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 I thought this was one of the most charming artists. Edgar Shaheen, for, 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 as they say on TV, for your information. Uh, the next one, well, this is much more famous. This is Whistler. Whistler came to Venice in uh, 1779 and did two series of etchings of, of, of Venice, of which this is arguably his most famous uh, uh, image. The Riva number one. It's he, he drew like all etchers. You draw on the plate so that when the paper is is printed on it, the image is in reverse. So you actually need a mirror when you look at these to see what the what it would actually have looked like in real life. But this is this is the Grand Canal. There are the gondolas in the distance. You could see you could actually make out San Marco way up at the top in the right, and there's the Benjamin Tower and so on. And this is Whistler's very impressionistic uh, and uh, technique. Of, of, he, he, he would sit in a gondola in some cases and just draw on, on, the, on the copper directly. There are no drawings that survive for the series. He, he drew directly on the plate. And this is in the exhibition in the section on Venice. Uh, Washington, the National Gallery, had an exhibition this autumn devoted to this artist. This is an American, John Taylor Arms. Whistler was an American, and Arms is American, and, and the last image we'll look at is by an American, uh, John Sloan. Uh, uh, Arms uh, loved the old buildings of Europe. He traveled around Europe, especially France, and uh, 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 drew them with a, a very... He, he, he was trained as an architect, so there's a very precise quality to his friends. I think the Washington show was called The Gothic Vision of John Taylor Arms, and uh, they didn't have this in the exhibition. And I asked my friends in Washington, I said, why wasn't this included? And they said, we couldn't find an impression of it. It was so rare. So I said, gee, we have one for the Sackler Museum. But this is, this is Mont Saint-Michel seen close up. We, we have a Cotman in the show where we see Mont Saint-Michel from a distance. But here we have a close up view of the great abbey, the Merveille, the, the, this, this great uh, spires of Gothic. And the next one, well, this is John Sloan. This is the last of the artists in the exhibition. Sloan was a member of a group of, of New York painters in the early 20th century. They were called the Ash Can School, you know, like the Garbage Can School, because they took subjects from everyday life. Uh, George Bellows, uh, Robert Henry, John Sloan, and others. Uh, uh, this, this is the L. The subway in New York is called the, the oldest part of it, the L, because it was elevated. It ran above the ground. And then later they figured out how to make subways that go under the ground as well. But I think there's still areas in the Bronx you know, where, the, where the subway still runs above the ground. But here we have the L about 1920 and a group of you know, young ladies coming back from work. They, they could all be in the series Mad Men come to think of it, you know, coming back from work in, yeah. in those costumes. Uh, the next one... This is the action by Sloan. I, was, I, I bought this at auction in April, and I was very, very happy to acquire it um, for a variety of reasons, uh, not least because the first six years that I lived in New York, I looked right out at this view. I lived in Washington Square Village, was the name of the apartment complex, and I looked right out. The statues of Garibaldi, 
the, uh, the arch is in honor of George Washington. Fifth <coughs> Avenue begins right at this point. And here we have a group of kids making snowmen. Uh, it, it's, it's called, I think, ice, ice sculpture, what is, what is this called, in, uh, in, in Washington Square Park. Sculpture in Washington Park is Sloan's title. I, I found an absolutely charming image by one of, one of the most important American artists of the 20th century. And uh, the next one, it was to show, you know, what, what, when, when I found that image of children playing, I remembered this image, which I had seen in Taiwan last summer. Remember that exhibition of, 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 of Sung painting? It, it's, it's called the Knickknack Peddler. It's, it's about a, not quite a thousand years old. But the, the, the peddler goes from town to town. On his shoulders, he, he's holding dozens and dozens of, of objects for sale, including toys. And, and here you have the children in the Song Dynasty, uh, uh, you know, crawling all over, you know, mommy, mommy, please can I have one of these toys? You know, what, what, one sees an image like this, is, is like a snapshot from, from ancient history, and we realize that in basic human matters, so little changes. You know, we all have one human heart, Wordsworth said. And so we have this wonderful image of, 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 uh, of, 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 of the figure. Uh, I'm told, somebody was telling me that there's not a great deal of pure figure painting in, in Song Dynasty, but I think th this one particular masterpiece is, is enough to say that there were great, great uh, artists in China who did the figure uh, in, 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 in you know, uh, 900 or so years ago. And the last image is back to Peter Bruegel, the, the, the most famous image in all of Western art. Uh, Bruegel, who did these huge, these paintings trying to put all of life into them. And here in this one painting in, in, in Vienna, like the other paintings of Bruegel that we saw at the very beginning of the talk, depicted every single known children's game that was known in Europe <laughs> at that time. I mean, some of them are harmless. They're boys swimming. I mean, they're they're, they're um, seesaws. They're they're rolling hoops. They're riding on people's backs. They're turning somersaults. Uh, it, it, it's just a wonderful image of of, 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 of children uh, in, enjoying themselves, uh, being, being being children. And you know, I, I when I when I saw the Sloane and I thought of the the Sun painting, I, I thought that there was there was no better image to end the show with than with the same artist with which we began with with, with Peter Roybal, you know, one one of the one of the very, very great artists of, of Western art and um, and, and that's really it. I, I, I was hoping to come up with a concluding remark of, of dazzling brilliance, but I couldn't. I, I, I can only point to this picture and, and say that I, I, I think this is this is this is really rather wonderful. What is that called? It's just called Children's Games. Children's. That, that's not Bruegel's title, but, but that's how the Vienna Museum uh, exhibits it under that, under that. He did a painting, which is in the Berlin Museum, of the Flemish Proverbs, where he illustrated all of the folk sayings of, of, of the time as well. Uh, but the, and and you, you may know Bruegel's paintings of the peasant dances, the peasant wedding and so on. Go, go to Google and look up Peter Bruegel and you'll come up. And there are lots of Chinese books. We have a Chinese Bruegel book. In, we, have, we have one that you can look at at the exhibition, which Dr. Sung bought online. Uh, I, I, we could, I couldn't find it in the bookstore, but you found it. So we have it that you, you can look at all of his works uh, 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 in, in the exhibition. And anyway, I've, I, I didn't know how long this talk would be when I started, and I figured an hour, an hour and a quarter, it's a little bit over. The, the opening of the exhibition is at 2 o'clock, and we have uh, treats this time. We have drinks and cookies and all sorts of nice things. Uh, and, and thank you very, very much for coming, and I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you.